It is the 13th of February 2005 and a city is watching one of its iconic skyscrapers burn. The city being treated to the destructive inferno is Madrid. Over the course of several hours, parts of the building crash down into the streets below. The fire will blaze for the best part of a day. Once eventually subdued, the true scale of the building's collapse becomes apparent. Ironically, the building at the time was undergoing a refurbishment to make it more protected from fire. Yet another building had succumbed to fire. Was it a design fault, manufacturing defect or something else? Well, watch on to find out. My name is John. Today we're looking at the Windsor Tower fire and partial collapse. Welcome to Plainly Difficult. Today's video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon and YouTube members. If you're interested, check it out. You get early access to videos, plus at the higher levels you get your name in the videos. Background Our story starts and will ultimately end here, the AZCA complex just outside and to the north of Madrid, Spain. The plan for the area was to create a commercial district with an opera house in the middle. Although the concept was originally thrown up in 1946, after multiple revisions and the general administration nightmares of buildings, finally the project began in the late 1960s, with works actually getting ramped up in the 1970s. During this nearly 20 year period, the project was wound back. The Opera House was scrapped, leaving a large open space in the centre, and various buildings didn't really match the intended original vibe of the complex. But spades were in the ground and Madrid's new complex was beginning to form. One of the new construction projects for this hodgepodge site was that of the Windsor Tower. Plans were penned in the early 1970s by the Del Rio Ferrero, Alas and Casarigo Studio with around eight architects working on the building's every detail. The building would have a total of 32 floors, standing up to a height of 106 metres. It was intended for mainly commercial office space. As such, the floors were designed to be as open as possible. But the floors were not completely clear. This was because of its central reinforced concrete core and its reinforced concrete columns. The former of the two carried the elevators, communication lines, plumbing and electrical wiring. The latter was there for structural rigidity and had steel beams at the top of each floor column running north to south. For further structural rigidity, the building had steel perimeter columns, which were supported by transfer structures at the second and sixteenth floors. These transfer structures took the space of two floors and were made of heavily reinforced concrete. They had no windows and were used to house the technical plant and other gubbins required to operate a tower block. Each floor slab was made of reinforced concrete at 280mm thick. Around the outside of the tower was clad with impressive glass windows. All of this was attached to the perimeter steel columns, as well as cladding. The building was designed with the fire regulations of the day in mind. This didn't require a sprinkler system to be installed, nor for the steel beam elements to be protected. On top of that, there was no requirement for fire stopping between cladding and the floor slabs. There was also no fire stopping between floors. This thrown in with the open plan of the floors meant fire containment was virtually non-existent. Now, back in the 1970s, fire protection standards weren't as good as they are today, clearly. But this wasn't really a problem unique to Spain, although it would be later addressed on in the building's life. But we'll come back to this in a little bit. So the construction began in 1975 and was completed in 1979, making it the tallest building in the AZCA complex, at least for a little while, until the Picasso Tower surpassed it in 1988. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the late 90s, with the building needing to be refurbished. Part of this would require the building being modernised in its fire resistance. The works would include the installation of new cladding, a new external escape staircase, a sprinkler system, an improved dry riser system, fire protection of the exposed steel columns, fire compartmentation between floors and finally fire stops between the building and its cladding. All very good improvements, but it would take time, roughly three years, and in 2004 work was making good progress. However, just a few months into 2005 all of this work would prove to be in vain. 
Just before we get on to the collapse, let me show you this article about another collapse from the other side of the world in India that I found on our sponsor, which you can also check out on ground.news slash plainly difficult. Ground News is a tool that can help cut through the confusing world we live in, where we are subjected to the rapid spread of hard to verify information through social media, echo chambers created by algorithms and filter bubbles, and financially incentivized click generating news pages. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer and will help guide you through the complex media landscape we found ourselves in. And it does this by gathering related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the globe. This allows you to see how the same story is reported at different outlets and importantly their political biases. Let's take a look at this article. Building collapse in India's Lucknow kills eight and injures dozens. It's been covered by 69 articles and has a 50% lean to the left. Check out this right-leaning article from India TV News. Lucknow building collapse. UP government forms three-member panel to probe incident. If we scroll down, we can compare that with a left-leaning publication. Ah, like this one from Dawn. Indian rescuers pull eight dead from collapsed building. You can see the story is being reported on the middle left of our political spectrum today. I for one find this really useful when researching for videos, as Ground News allows me to get a fuller picture of an event. What I really like is the blind spot feature, which allows you to check for stories that you may not always see due to having strong political biases either way. And if this interests you, and I think you will, go to ground.news slash plainly difficult to give it a try. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all features. I think Ground News is doing important work, and I hope you'll check them out. Right, now let's get back to the video. The Disaster It is the closing out of the 12th of February 2005. The works so far have protected up to the 17th floor steelwork. At roughly 11pm, either a lit cigarette or a short circuit, I mean I've read both explanations in different papers, started a fire on the 21st floor. Within an hour, the fire was licking up the sides of the tower's top floor. Quickly, after the fire services were called and started fighting the inferno, the flames were quickly spreading to the entirety of the building. Helped by the unpartitioned building and its cladding gaps, the next few hours allowed the flames to slowly spread to the floors below. At around 12.30 at night, the fire brigade, realising that they weren't able to completely extinguish the fires, took a more defensive approach in order to try and protect the buildings around it. Parts of the building's upper floor's facade began to fall down, smashing into the ground. At around 3am, the flames were past the upper technical floor at the 16th storey, and the fire could be seen for miles around. In total, during the fight, as many as 205 firefighters and 40 vehicles worked to try and quell the flames. But although flaring up to temperatures of a thousand degrees centigrade for several hours, the building couldn't hold any more. At between 1.37 in the morning and 4am in the morning, the top floors progressively collapsed, smashing into the floors below it. Eventually, the collapse was stopped at the 17th floor. This was the top part of the technical floor with the extra reinforcement. And at around 4.17am, parts of the debris which had been bent during the fire had fallen off the building. From the 17th floor upwards, much of the building's steel perimeter and internal columns had failed, piling up a mass of bent steel. The only thing remaining of the upper floors was the solid central reinforced concrete core. Interestingly, however, the new emergency staircase was still intact. But the fire didn't end there. It would take several more hours and thousands of litres of water to finally get it under control. Thankfully no one was killed during the fire, however many firefighters had experienced smoke inhalation, which would need hospital treatment. The building, once fully unfired, would be deemed a write-off, with an estimated loss of 72 million euro. This would require the painstaking dismantling of the tower, which after storms, snow, accidents and various problems, was finally completed in August 2005. The work was a logistical nightmare, removing each floor individually using four cranes, one of which would fail, causing parts of it to crash into the ground. And again, luckily, no one here was properly injured. The disaster caused a lot of financial problems for local businesses and the companies that had used the Windsor Tower as offices. A replacement would be built in the footprint of the Windsor Tower, and this was called the Titania Building. 
it was open for business in 2013. But you probably aren't too bothered by that, so much as you want to know what was the cause. The investigation. Pretty much as soon as the fire was extinguished, forensic investigators started scouring over the wreckage. The actual starting event couldn't be determined. This was due to the 21st floor burning for nearly 20 hours and subsequently collapsing. Understandably, these are not the best conditions for evidence preservation. The temperature during the fire was estimated to be in excess of 1000 degrees centigrade. The intensity and spread was put down to the fuel kept in the building for plant machinery, flammable furniture and the total lack of active fire suppression systems. It probably didn't take much to notice the difference in outcome for the upper floors compared to the lower ones. The fire was able to spread via the chimney effect through both the central core and behind the building's cladding. When compared with the levels that had the steel columns fire protection before the fateful night, it is clear that the lack of protection on the upper floors was probably a major part of the collapse. You can see the effectiveness of the fire protection in comparison with the ninth floor, which was still being fireproofed. Just look at the buckle columns. Above it and below had been proofed. The warping and bending of the perimeter columns eventually led to a progressive collapse and failure of the slab concrete floors. Shushank Gupta summarised this in their paper. It was believed that the multiple floor fire, along with the simultaneous buckling of the unprotected steel perimeter columns at several floors, triggered the collapse of the floor slabs above the 17th floor. If the building had been fully fire protected, likely it would have fared much better, or even just put out the fire before it had taken a chance to take hold. The difference in damage between the upper and lower floors is like night and day. However, the central core still survived all the way up to the top. On the 31st of January 2006, the judge presiding over the collapse investigation concluded that the fire was accidental due to a lack of evidence of accelerants found during the forensic search. However, they also said, the total destruction of the 21st floor makes it completely impossible from a technical point of view to accurately indicate the heat source. But there is some speculation that this may not be the case, as there may have been a benefit to the building's demise for one of its tenants. Auditing company, it was about to be requested for the documentary evidence of their audit of F.G. Valores during their sale to Merrill Lynch in 1996. Their company paperwork, which was stored in the tower, happily for all involved, went up in flames on the 12th of February 2005, as noted in Moncloa.com's article. The Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office had requested these documents from the auditor, Deolite, the day before the accident. There was a reported 4.5 million euro accounting gap during the sale to Merrill Lynch. Deolite's offices were on the 21st floor, the one where the fire had started. The cause is still thought to be a toss-up between either a cigarette or short circuit. Still, no one was charged criminally for the fire. I won't go down any further on the conspiracy wormhole, but I would like you to let me know what you think. Tell me in the comments below. So it's scale time, it's going to be a 2. And this is what I got for the bingo card. This is a plaintiff for production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plaintiff for videos are produced by me, John, in a currently quite warm corner of southern London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching. And Mr. Music, play us out, please.